And what I think they should be learning is that if you get into a war with a nuclear armed great power, you will get a lot of support from the Americans. You will get arms, you will get diplomatic support, you will get sanctions support, you will get intelligence support, but will you get American troops? Probably not. Now, the obvious counter argument here is, well, Taiwan is not Ukraine. Taiwan's much more important to Ukraine. But my response to that is simply, well, you, you, you maybe haven't thought through the consequences of going to war with China. You haven't, you haven't read, thought through the full consequences, which, is, which actually ends at a nuclear exchange and possibly the extinction of the human species. Right? Hello, Sam Rogovin. Welcome to the Burning Archive podcast. Thanks for inviting me, Jeff. Sam, your book, uh, The Echidna Strategy, has been quite a sensation <laughs> in Australia over the last, I don't know, six months or so, because uh, you've sort of questioned the, uh, I guess what you might call the unthinking American alliance. You've uh, proposed an alternative defence strategy and you've even sort of proposed perhaps some different directions for foreign policy uh, in Australia. It seems to me that has taken quite a bit of courage on your part because you're ex-intelligence analyst and uh, they're, uh, you know, senior person at the Lowy Institute, Australia's leading think tank. What's it been like for you over the last six months or so um, uh, putting out that sort of position? Well, thank you. And I, I appreciate the compliment. And it's not, it's generally considered impolite to uh, to throw compliments back in someone's face. So, I, but 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 I will need to I I, I will need to um, push back gently against um, uh, the claim of courage. Although m much as I appreciate it, um, I can't take I, I can't take that entirely at face value. In the sense that I, I work in an incredibly supportive environment at the Lowy Institute, where free thinking is encouraged. I also happen to live in one of the freest countries in the world where um, uh, free thought is not punished and there is no intimidation uh, of people who, uh, you know, who publish uh, ideas that maybe a little, uh, that challenge the status quo or are slightly outside the mainstream. So, you know, compared to people in other countries who, um, who take uh, those kind of positions, I I'm, I'm very privileged. Um, so uh, I, you know, I always try to remember that and and be be humble and thankful for it. The the, the book has been a success, and uh, I think overall, what I have to say is that rather than me having to take a risk or lose any skin over it, ultimately it's been uh, very beneficial for me professionally. I think my status has risen uh, professionally. I get invited to do conversations like this one, which I wouldn't have before. Um, Alan Gingell, actually, a few years ago, was the person who encouraged me to write this book when I had my doubts about whether to do it. Uh, the late Alan Gingell, who uh, a lot of us in the foreign policy community uh, miss very dearly. Um, so I've got Alan to thank, actually, for encouraging me to do it, and I'm pleased I did it. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a great benefit to me, and I hope some, of some benefit to the people who've read it. I, I did notice, and perhaps courage wasn't quite the right word, but there was a sense of real, I guess... Um, ethical responsibility i guess i felt in the in the book and there was one particularly in your little passage where you talk about whether australia should i guess go to war with china uh over taiwan you, you say there if i just quote um if it comes to that australia would have a solemn duty to the entire world to prevent the very worst from happening because the real enemy would be war itself. And that, that sense of, I guess, responsibility to the world, I guess, was one of the things that I, I felt really uh, I admired about, about your book. Oh, that's, that's kind, and I'm, I'm glad that, thank you, and I'm glad you picked up on it. Um, uh, I, I, I do feel that way, and I, I did try to wrestle at the beginning of, I think the quote you just uh, read out there is from the end of the book, but I did try to wrestle at the beginning of the book with competing ethical quandaries. Um, on the one hand, uh, I think it's important in any book related to defence policy in Australia, and it's too seldom done, to talk about the, the opportunity cost of defence spending and the fact that actually you are ultimately, you know, taking taking um, in a metaphorical sense the food out of babies' mouths you know the 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 the, the, 
the money that government spends every year ideally always goes towards human flourishing in various forms, whether that's to helping the, the least worst off amongst us to live, dignity, to live in dignity, uh, or whether it's to improve our education system or our health system or what have you, or in, if it comes to that, to give more money back to our taxpayers so, so that they can, they can choose how to spend their money. Um, defence spending is is in every sense a uh, a waste, an unfortunate waste, but an inescapable one too. So not not only is it ethically difficult to justify defence spending, it's also it's also an ethical duty to defend Australia, um, because whatever uh, whatever faults our nation may have, uh, n- none of them are going to be made better if it's a country that is somehow under the thumb or under the subjugation of a foreign power. Australia's, uh, you know, we, we've built something remarkable in this country. This this nation is actually a miracle in its own way, and it's worth defending. It's worth defending, and so I'm, uh, I think it's important to do that, but to do it in the most efficient and effective way possible. And, that, and that, that's really what the book's about. I, I've, I try to, uh, I try to strip away some of the complexity of the defence debate in Australia, and where I end is really to say that. Uh, in essence, Australia is not that difficult to defend. We make it harder than it needs to be, uh, and there is a you know a reasonably simple formula, not not easy but relatively straightforward, uh, that can keep Australia safe. And that takes us nicely to AUKUS and nuclear submarines, three hundred and sixty-five billion worth of nuclear submarine, um, uh, which. Uh, Hugh White has just said in the last week or so in this essay that it's dead in the water uh, and it's unlikely ever to be delivered. So it's a pretty... The, the essay is the essay's called... Yeah, the, the essay is yeah. called dead in the water. The essay itself is not dead in the yeah, water. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. That's right. Um, what's your assessment of AUKUS and the nuclear submarines? And I guess why that particular defence strategy was chosen by mm. the Australian government? Well, the question of why we went down this this path is still really contested and uh, controversial and a little bit vague in my mind. Um, the, the If you like this sort of prehistory of AUKUS, like how did, how did we get here? That, that's still a bit of a mystery and... I think there's a gap there for some enterprising journalists to write the first draft of history there, especially now with um, uh, with Morrison having uh, moved on from government service, Boris Johnson in the UK. Uh, in the next year or two, some of the officials in Australia that were central to it will probably move on as well, uh, if they haven't already. So I think there is a moment there for, uh, I think, an enterprising journalist or historian to sit down and say, well, how, how actually did this happen? Um, Because it's still quite opaque. Um, Look, my my sort of principled objection to AUKUS really is one about the fundamentals of Australian defence, and this is you know what I referred to in my previous answer. Um, And and I'll use a line here that I've used many times in the book and in in talking about the book. So if if people who have heard me speak about this before, I apologise if they've heard it before, but. it it seems to me that Australia's single biggest defence asset is distance. We are very far away from any country or any capability that would threaten us militarily. Uh, Beijing is closer to Berlin than it is to Sydney. And we often forget just how far away we are. Um, For instance, a couple of years ago, uh, before his passing, Senator Jim Molan, former uh, Australian Army General Jim Molan, wrote a book about the, the, the threat from the Chinese People's Liberation Army called Danger on Our Doorstep. And my response to that is, well, if so, then that's a bloody big doorstep, right? Uh, there's a huge distance that separates us. And my objection to AUKUS really rests on that point. AUKUS and the submarines in particular are effectively an attempt to compress the distance between Australia and China. Whereas what I think we should be doing is exploiting the distance between us and China. Now, what do I mean by compressing? Well, look, the, the, the signature capabilities that nuclear submarines bring are long range and long endurance. Uh, of many others, of course, nuclear powered submarines are incredibly deadly and effective. The, you know, the, the battleships of the modern, wor- the modern uh, maritime world. 
But those are the two outstanding qualities that Australia is getting these boats for. And so I ask myself, well, how do you best exploit those two features, long range and long endurance? Well, you don't do it by by using the submarines around Australia's coast. You can, you can, to a degree, exploit their capabilities that way, but that's not the full exploitation of their capabilities. The way you fully exploit the capabilities of nuclear-powered submarines is to operate them close to China and where they can stay on station for weeks and even months on end. Uh, and into the bargain, where we're, we're buying uh, long-range cruise missiles to fit on these submarines, cruise missiles that are specifically designed to hit land targets. Now, unless you're, prepared, you're planning to hit China, then the, the, the list of missions for these missiles is pretty short. There are other justifications, but the main one is hitting China. So altogether, what I see is uh, uh, a program to build a submarine fleet that is specifically designed to take the battle to China. And my simple reply is, well, in the unlikely event that China ever wants to threaten us, let them come to us. Let them traverse that vast distance that separates us from China. Because that's hard work. Traversing those thousands of kilometres is incredibly hard work. Uh, and actually directing significant amounts of military force across that distance is a very difficult enterprise. So I think we're, we're, we're used to... I think people who pay maybe occasional attention to military affairs might think that um, the problem of distance has somehow been solved, you know, that advanced military powers can somehow project force over, to any place on the world that they please. And in, in some ways that's true, like particularly with nuclear weapons. All the major powers, all the uh, superpowers, have nuclear weapons that can reach any place on Earth. But below that threshold, when we're talking about conventional warfare, uh, it is still extremely difficult uh, to direct significant amounts of military force over long distances. So the simple illustration that I use in the book is that if you think of a, of a military commander who is told by his boss, well, you need to destroy a target uh, over the next hill and you have 500 kilograms of high explosive to do it. And so if the target is over the next hill, then that commander will probably use mortar, mortar tubes, or maybe even move the explosive in a truck over the next hill in the dead of night and then uh, detonate it from a distance. But now let's say that that target is not over the next hill. Let's say it's 5,000 metres away. Well, in that case, he has to use artillery. And if it's 500 kilometres away, then he has to. Then he needs aircraft. He needs bombers. And let's say it's 5,000 kilometres away. Well, at that point, you need an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile. Now, at every point along that spectrum, uh, the task, the actual, the, the task of moving that amount of explosive onto a target, becomes exponentially more difficult and more expensive. So you go from a truck to a mortar tube, to an artillery piece, to an aircraft, to an ICBM. An ICBM is a massively expensive thing. You need a, an entire national infrastructure to build an ICBM. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars. So all along that spectrum, it gets exponentially more expensive. And yet the actual military power that you're projecting remains constant. It's still 500 kilograms of high explosive all along that spectrum. So that, tell, that in itself, I think, illustrates how distance protects us. And as I say, we are at the moment engaged in a military strategy that attempts to compress that distance when I say it's much cheaper and easier to exploit it. Yeah. So in, would I be right in saying, in a way, we've chosen offence rather than defence in a way? And the reason we've chosen offence is fundamentally i think you say in the book we've taken a big bet on uh american primacy in asia is that yes essentially I, right that that is essentially right because it because because of course if it was just us then an offensive strategy would make no sense at all i mean it would be madness for australia alone to say to the chinese well come on we're gonna we're gonna face you down and we're gonna you know mano a mano that makes no sense at all for a middle power against a great power so the only way in which an offensive strategy makes sense is if we are allying with the United States. And that's why AUKUS is such a big bet on American power and you know, essentially a big bet on us saying that American power 
American primacy is sustainable in our region and crucially that America will be motivated to maintain its primacy in yeah. Asia. And and your judgment would be that neither of those things is likely to continue, that that American relative power is waning and its mm. its real interest in projecting power into Asia is is more 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 uh, vanity not quite vanity project but um, uh, reputational perhaps or prestige oriented rather than um, uh, the, the reality of what's required to defend America all those kilometers away <laughs> across the Pacific Ocean yeah yeah so I, I, I want to be careful here to say that um, that this is in no way a sort of anti-American book and uh, I think Amer the United States has all the ingredients to maintain its position as one of the two leading world powers for the remainder of this century. Uh, it has a massive military, it has a huge and by, by the standards of its rivals, a very young population uh, that can maintain and and uh, continue America's economic growth um, for you know an indefinite amount of time. It also has thousands of nuclear weapons, and it's separated from China by two vast oceans. Not to mention it has friendly neighbours, north and south. But I would add that those are also reasons why it's not essential for the United States to take on China in the Asia Pacific. So that's really important, you know, important caveat. America is strong but it doesn't really have enough motivation. And because China also is so strong, because China's also so big, in fact, it's the biggest rival that the United States has faced ever in the course of the 20th century, much bigger than Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, or the, uh, the Communist Soviet Union, much bigger in economic terms. To take on a state of that stature, you need a really good reason. You need an existential reason. So what is it that China can do that threatens the fundamentals of American democracy and of American statehood. And I would argue not very much. Um, America is incredibly secure. So even in the worst case scenario where China becomes the dominant power in all of Asia, let's say the United States packed up its bags and left tomorrow and China became the dominant power, all of Asia was subjugated. That seems to me an incredibly unlikely future, by the way, but let's say it happened. Even at that point, I feel America's core national interests are relatively secure. Um, there's, it's not even clear that in, in such a scenario, America would be economically excluded from Asia in the same way that China is not economically excluded from South America or America, you know, the, the Western hemisphere, America's sphere of influence in the same way that Europe is not excluded from Asian uh, economies, even though it is not, it hasn't been for decades, the, uh, uh, an important military power in this region. So I don't, I don't think I don't think the economics works out. I don't think the, the the security stuff is really compelling enough for the United States. So ultimately, for all of those reasons, my argument is: well, we, we can't expect the Americans to make sacrifices on our behalf. So I, I'm not making a moral judgment about American uh, character or about American courage. I'm really just making a prudential judgment about its interests, whatever its core interests. And when you make that very you know cold judgment, uh, as I think American policymakers will ultimately make a very cold judgment about its interests, then I think you have to say, well, actually, we're going to have to do much more of this ourselves. The Americans won't be there for us ultimately. Um, I've heard some people say that um, the, the sort of Australian decision around AUKUS kind of reflects a kind of a fear of Asia, fear of China kind of thing, even, you know, um, sort of background racism in Australia. It's not what I think, but I've heard that sort of argument addressed. Um, uh, what do you think? Do you think that's a valid argument or how would you respond to that in terms of what the um, policy drivers or the, 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 the influences on the decision makers were likely to be that led to AUKUS? Look, I'm, I'm sure there are some corners of the debate where there is some sublimated racism going on. Uh, I also think if we step one, one slight level above that, we might say that the idea of Asia being led by Asians is so unfamiliar 
that we find it hard to internalize. Um, but what I would also say is that it's not at all irrational for Australia to fear Chinese power. And it's not at all irrational for Japan and the rest of the region to fear China's power and China's ambitions. It makes perfect sense and we ought to prepare ourselves. So my, I, I'm, I'm very, um, uh, I was very anxious in the book not to downplay, not, not to be any kind of apologist for Chinese ambitions or Chinese power. I think basically we do have to take, take seriously the idea that China wants uh, to become strategically dominant in our region. My objection really is to how we've gone about trying to prevent that from happening. I think we've, we've chosen a very strange path towards that, uh, the riskiest and I think the, the, the least reliable path towards preventing Chinese domination. And the, there, is a, there is a smarter way to do it. But at the risk of over-complimenting you, Sam, I guess one of the other um, uh, responses I had to the book was... Um, because like I used to be a bureaucrat in the Victorian government for decades and um, uh, your book read like someone who had really been responsible for having to think through um, worst case scenarios kind of and and actually you know and I guess that's what defense strategy is no one really wants to prepare for a war but you <laughs> to some degree you uh, you need someone to do that job and Again, that was part of the thing about your book that I found really uh, quite interesting. But yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, that, that's a very nice compliment. I, I, I mean that sincerely. So uh, thank you very much. And I, I, I do take that very seriously. I, I, and I do worry sometimes actually that uh, among defence specialists, there is um, uh, there's a Leonard Cohen phrase, um, I am guided by the beauty of our weapons. You know, there, there is a certain... The, the, and 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 I'm I'm conscious of this because I had it myself when I was younger. What what first got me started in this world was simply a, a sort of boy's own amazement with the technology, and I still have it to some degree. Uh, I am uh, amazed and fascinated, but these days also slightly appalled by um, the 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 most exotic and innovative ways we can find to kill one another. Um, so it, it, it's, it's easy to be seduced by that. And I'm glad that you think that, uh, that I managed to avoid it in the book. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your alternative, the, uh, echidna strategy? Um, what's, uh, cause one of the striking things about it was it's sort of more effective, it's cheaper and, uh, it, it has less risk. So, but, uh, what, what in summary is your alternative, uh, defense strategy for Australia? Yeah, well, I'm glad you made the distinction early on between an offensive and a defensive strategy. And essentially what I'm calling for is very much a defensive strategy. So uh, strategists uh, often distinguish between, I mean, strategists are as one in arguing that the, that the purpose of military power is to deter conflict. And if deterrence fails, to win, right? So I, I'm, I'm basically on board with that formulation. We, we, the whole reason we have an Australian Defence Force is so that we never have to use it. Um, but of course, there are many ways to deter. And I argue that as a, as a middle power that's, that is potentially independently ha gonna have to face off against a much, uh, a much bigger power in China, it's not within our reach to say that we can ever win a conflict against China. But what we can do is impose so many costs on China that it will reach the point where China decides, well, this is not worth it in the first place. And that, that to me is within our grasp and that can be done in a purely defensive sense. So we don't need the capability to hit the Chinese mainland, for instance. And in fact, we want to avoid that because it's unnecessarily provocative. What we want to do is essentially develop the capabilities to negate Chinese military power. And really the, the only way that uh, any foreign military power can project significant amounts of force against Australia is by air and by sea. And so that means what we need, and this is really an, a very, quite an old formula in Australia defence, is the capability to secure the northern maritime approaches to Australia, the air and maritime approaches to Australia. Uh, and we do that essentially with, with a... Uh, what, what's typically referred to among strategists as an area denial capability. 
That is to say, you make it unsafe for any for any uh, adversary's aircraft or ship to operate in Australia's uh, northern approaches. So lots of um, surveillance equipment and uh, surveillance assets and detection equipment and targeting so that you can basically sink ships, uh, sink ships and uh, down aircraft that are preparing to use uh, force against Australia. Of course, the other way that um, a foreign power can project significant amounts of military force against Australia is if they have bases in our near abroad. So that's another key part of the book and a key part of the argument is Australia needs to prevent uh, Chinese military basing in our near abroad. And that is a serious concern. And there, there is good evidence that China has made some forays, diplomatic forays in the region uh, to try to secure military basing. There's also evidence that China is trying to develop, is already building a naval base in Cambodia. Uh, so that makes it easier for China to project military force out into the region. But largely that's a diplomatic task, not a military one. Ultimately, you may need to neutralise such facilities militarily, but first and foremost, uh, preventing China from building military bases in our near abroad is a diplomatic task. And it's one we actually we've done with some success up to now in the Pacific Islands region. Um, so look, my, my, my strategy is essentially defensive um, and it's not, uh, it doesn't, the, the, the ADF, the Australian Defence Force, is, is, is a second order priority for mine when it comes to securing, uh, when it comes to building that strategy. The first part of it is, uh, is a statecraft strategy of building, a lot, uh, uh, securing our presence in the Pacific Islands region, uh, developing a much closer strategic partnership with Indonesia and um, trying to build a, a sustainable regional order that secures peace. And then backing all of that up is, is an Australian Defence Force with it, which has a, a purely defensive uh, denial style military posture. So it's kind of a pivot to diplomacy, so to speak. And in fact, you it's say somewhere in the book, it. I think, that Australia should be a diplomatic uh, superpower rather or powerhouse perhaps I think was the term rather than superpower yeah. but powerhouse uh, rather than um, you know pretending to be a naval superpower with nuclear submarines but um, yes and I mean, and I mean we, we shouldn't understate what Australia is trying to achieve I mean we, we can talk about the uh, AUKUS as well if you like and about the likelihood that it ever happens but if we focus purely on what's being planned now uh, eight nuclear-powered submarines and, as of a few days ago, announcements of essentially a doubling of our surface warfare fleet. I mean, it's a massively ambitious project, which, when you put it together, let's, let's assume it all comes off, vaults Australia pretty decisively to, you know, the, the, the top, let's say, the top part of the second rank of global maritime powers. So not China and not the United States and not Russia, but up there with with France, the United Kingdom, India, Japan. So we, we, we are we are moving onto the high table of global maritime power. Uh, what what I say in the book is that I'm very ambitious for Australia, but defence policy is the wrong thing to be ambitious about, and that's why I say yes. Let's let's be a diplomatic powerhouse rather than a military one. I'd like to come back to that because I guess one of the interesting, I mean, my program kind of focuses on sort of world history, which is my interpretation of geopolitics. I, when most people talk geopolitics, I think they're really talking world history. But um, yeah, as you said, like, you know, uh, this is a perhaps an historic transition where, you know, Asia will be ruled by the Asians rather than Europeans and Americans, Australians. But um, just on, on, on AUKUS with Hugh White's recent uh, essay. He he's very um, uh, negative about the, well, you know, critical of the likelihood of uh, AUKUS ever being or, or the nuclear submarines ever being delivered, and in fact also raises the question about whether the uh, the existing submarine capacity, I think they're called the Collins class submarines, will sort of mm -hmm. kind of you know basically sort of become redundant in in the meantime and hence leave a great gaping hole in Australia's naval defences. Um, have you had a chance to sort of look at Hugh White's essay and, and ha had any particular thoughts on it? Uh, 
Yeah, look, I've read it very carefully and, and I, for the record, it's worth stating that I've known Hugh and we've been friends for for uh, many, many years now and I, you've read my book carefully and it's it's clear that the debt I owe to Hugh, I mean, we, we differ on many aspects, uh, I'd say um, many of the details around uh, around the future of our region and about Australian defence, for instance, but the major thrust of Hugh's thinking, particularly about American resolve in the region, uh, that, that's that been incredibly influential on me and I owe him a huge debt about that. So, look, yes, I, I read his, his essay very carefully and I have, uh, I, I don't think I came away from it thinking there were major, I had major points of difference with him. What he does very forensically is just describe how difficult this project is going to be. Um, so, you know, in the end, all of the strategic arguments that I have made in this conversation with you, Jeff, about AUKUS may turn out to be redundant because the, it will be overwhelmed simply by the practicalities of the project. So I, I would I would describe it this way, that in, in the Australian defence debate, there are two kinds of AUKUS sceptics. One, one is the strategic sceptics, which of, of which Hugh and myself uh, number, um, but also more prom- much more prominently, Paul Keating is a strategic sceptic, so is Malcolm Turnbull. But I would argue that, that that's still a minority among, among commentators and defence experts. I would say the str- in, in strategic terms, most of the, that commentariat and the exper- experts would argue AUKUS is a good idea in theory. But then there's the second school of AUKUS scepticism, and that is those who say, well, this is a good idea in theory, however... The practical barriers are so massive that it's never going to happen. And I would say that that school of AUKUS scepticism is overwhelmingly in the majority. There are a handful of people um, who, who think we can get this done, but most of the people who publicly argue that, yes, we will get this done, are people who are actually paid to be optimistic about it, which is to say the politicians who are backing it and public servants among sort of dispassionate observers even among sort of uh, died in the wall supporters of AUKUS in principle, you will hear a great deal of scepticism about whether we can actually mm. get it done. Mm. So it might be, uh, we, we might, uh, the bureaucracy in Canberra might be uh, faced with a challenge of kind of um, waiting for the whole thing to fall over and then come up with a new arrangement at some point. Yeah. Well, it's funny actually to reflect. Or pessimistic. No, no, you're not being. I mean, look, what, what? No, you're not. You're not being too pessimistic because, after all, we've been here twice before, just in recent years. So we had a handshake agreement with Japan, and that, that was under Tony Abbott, and we reneged on that. And then we had a contract with the French, and we cancelled that. So why wouldn't we be back here in another few years saying this is not going to happen? I, I don't think that's unduly cynical. So that 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 may very well happen. I, I was in. Um, I was in Seoul recently for a conference and I saw a lot of AUKUS envy there in uh, in South Korea, a lot of officials and think tankers there saying, well, wh- why couldn't we get the Americans to do this with us? And my response was to be careful what you wish for. Uh, the, South Koreans, the South Koreans actually make really good diesel submarines. And so I reassure, I, I, I said to them, look, in a few years time, we may be coming to you for submarines rather than you looking to AUKUS as an example. What about the, um, maybe if we talk now about the sort of diplomatic situation in terms of how Australia adapts to and people differ about how they describe, I guess, how the world international system is changing, like American primacy is declining or American primacy in Asia is declining or it's a multipolar world or... um, it was always a multipolar world. The unipolar moment was an illusion. Um, however you describe it, there do seem to be these big changes going on in the world and Australia seems to need to adapt to that and clinging in the way that we are all being the very, very best ally possible to the United States at the moment may not be the best way to adapt. And you've got some really interesting ideas in your book um, around that, uh, including like 
the you talk about a Pacific Union and as in mm-hmm. like it's sort of an economic union, if I read it correctly, of, of the sort of Pacific Island states, um, which presumably I don't know whether that includes Australia as a Pacific Island state or yep, yep, and uh, a kind of defence arrangement with Indonesia, and you even talk about uh, like a concert of well, concert of powers yeah. in maritime Asia, um, or collective security agreement. I, I don't, I'm not quite sure what the right term for it is. And since you wrote your book, I mean, we've had the situation in Gaza, we've got the situation in Yemen, um, mm. you know, there's the ongoing issues in Ukraine, etc. cetera. But uh, what, how do you see, I guess, the general kind of world international security environment and what that means for the key priorities for sort of Australia for Australia to become. Yeah, well, well, let me start with America because that is, you know, that is the rock on which our security and foreign policy is uh, is so much built. And this, if I had to summarise it, I would argue that America is in the process of becoming a more normal great power, which is to say, not an exceptional nation in having you know global. Uh, military and strategic interests where nothing is beyond, uh, almost nothing in the world is beyond uh, America's reach and beyond America's interests. Uh, I think it's in the process of actually slimming down its interest to becoming a more normal great power, which is, which will have a sphere of influence in its own region, which is to say the Western Hemisphere in the US, and of course has, some, uh, has many uh, global economic interests, but is not a kind of global security guarantor as the US is now. Um, and you you mentioned uh, the, the, the wars that are uh, so prominent in our daily news feeds today. So I think one, one bit of evidence for the proposition I just gave you about the future of American power is actually Ukraine. On the one hand, I think we've all been surprised, myself included, about the 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 unity and the resolve that Western powers have shown with regard to Ukraine, unprecedented levels of economic sanctions. No one expected them to be, you know, be quite so tough and far reaching, even if you know, after two years, the evidence is it's not working. Uh, still, it was, quite, um, it was quite something to even get to the point that they got to. Uh, the level of uh, military aid to Ukraine has surprised everybody as well, including now fairly long range systems that are you know, pushing against the barriers or what were previously uh, thought of as barriers against um, uh, what of, of, uh, of Russian retaliation and, and, and the possibility of, um, uh, of Russia broadening the war. Uh, there's also been intelligence support to Ukraine, which has been crucial, um, diplomatic backing, of course. But there's a, there's a clear red line there as well for the Americans. It's been clear from the very start uh, and it's not just America, it's NATO allies as well. And that is that the, none of them are prepared to get directly involved in the war and oppose the Russians themselves. So in the early days of the war, there was talk of a NATO enforced no-fly zone that was rejected because it would have brought NATO and the United States directly into combat with Russian forces. Uh, since then, of course, we've seen reluctance to supply really long-range weaponry. That's been eroded over time a little bit, but there are still places that the US and its partners won't go because they're worried about risking a wider war. Uh, and of course, most obviously, n- none of the NATO powers led by the US are committing troops to, uh, to Ukraine. Now, it seems to me in the Asia-Pacific that there are there, there is a critical lesson in that for all America's allies. But if I was Taiwan, that would be the country that would be that, that I think should be taking these lessons most seriously. And what I think they should be learning is that if you get into a war with a nuclear armed great power, you will get a lot of support from the Americans. You'll get arms, you will get diplomatic support, you will get sanctions support, you will get intelligence support. But will you get American troops? Probably not. Now, the obvious counter argument here is, well, Taiwan is not Ukraine. Taiwan's much more important to Ukraine. But my response to that is simply, well, you, you, you maybe haven't thought through the consequences of going to war with China. You haven't, you haven't read, thought through the full consequences, which, is, which actually ends at a nuclear exchange uh, 
and possibly the extinction of the human species, right? To contemplate a war on that scale, the stakes need to be incredibly high and it's and it's not good enough. As important as Taiwan is for reasons that, you know, we're all familiar with, chips, uh, access to the second island chain, all of the rest, as important as that is, it may not be important enough to risk World War Three over. So I think that's that's an important lesson for all of America's allies in Asia to to internalise that America is in the process of becoming a much more normal great power, and actually that their America's alliances in Asia may start to um, Ukraineize, if you will, which is to say, you know, plenty of military and diplomatic support. They'll still be selling weapons and sharing intelligence, but the actual deterrence work of committing being willing to spill blood you'll have to do that yourself um so that is that is i think um that, that that's a very slow process and the interim stage is it's not like and, and here is a point of difference between myself and hugh white hugh i think can foresee a future in which the united states packs up and goes home entirely and i confess that under trump that that's a more likely possibility than it would be under any other president of course but it seems to me still the more likely future is just a it's just a steady erosion of American resolve. The troops stay in place, but American resolve declines. So the, 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 the belief that we have that the Americans are there for us, that's that erodes, that's already eroding um, because of you know Ukraine, among other things. Uh, I mean, is it feasible to imagine a kind of um, collective security agreement? for the West Pacific that includes all the major powers in the Western no. Pacific. No, I don't think no, I don't think that's realistic. I, I don't I don't think that's realistic <laughs> yeah. because so l- let me let me try and paraphrase you and say what you're what you're asking me about yeah. is the possibility of an Asian NATO. And so uh, 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 no, no, I, 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 I'm probably thinking more like a post NATO, I mean, imagine uh, there were a post NATO collective security agreement yeah. in Europe, kind of thing. Yeah, sorry. I, I, Would you have something comparable in the West Pacific, and so avoid the situation where you end up with uh, a war over the current security arrangements yeah. in the West Pacific? Yeah. Apologies, I probably confused the issue with yeah. with NATO because NATO, of course, involves the United States, and you're talking about a sort of post-American collective security arrangement. So my answer. Well, I mean, but presumably America could be. I mean, is it, is it beyond mm. the capacity of China and America, Japan and Indonesia, Australia, all the other major powers in in the West Pacific to negotiate yeah. some sort of arrangement, which is less tense? Um, guarantees you know all those trade routes yeah so so my answer is still no in this uh to uh, a collective security arrangement that's designed to uh to constrain chinese power uh simply because our region is too large uh actually two factors one geographically it's too large and two economically we are all individually tied uh to China to an extent that makes it difficult for all of us to get together in any kind of arrangement that's designed to constrain Chinese ambitions. Um, the, the, the geography part matters in the sense that uh, Europe, uh, NATO makes sense as a collective security arrangement because Europe is a unitary, is a unified strategic space. It makes perfect sense for uh, the Spaniards and the Norwegians to say to themselves, to say to each other, look, a threat against us is also a threat against you and vice versa, because it's a, it's a relatively contained and unified strategic space. That's simply not true in our region. It's much larger, much more dispersed, and a, a military threat against India, for instance, is in no way a military threat against Japan or against Australia. So let's say there's another border clash between China and India, and it gets much bigger. Is there any future, realistically, in which we would see Australia or Japan committing troops to uh, to India on India's behalf to defend itself against China? I would say absolutely not. Uh, so n- not in the same way that we could imagine, uh, say, the, the Spanish military committing to defend the border between Poland and Russia. That's much more realistic, I think. 
uh, than, than to see a similar kind of thing uh, happening on the border between China and India. So geography is against any kind of collective security arrangement and so is economics because uh, uh, all of these countries you're talking about are much more intertwined with China economically than are Europe, the European powers with Russia, for instance. Um, and, and that means none of them will want to sacrifice those economic relations on behalf of the others. So for, for, first of all, that, I mean, that sounds like dire news. If we can't do it collectively, how on earth, how on earth are we going to do it individually, right? So my answer to that, my answer to that is firstly that uh, even though distance is uh, a, a um, makes it harder to defend ourselves collectively, it does make it easier to do it individually. It's very difficult for China to project force over the oceans for the reasons we talked about earlier. Distance protects us, and it gives the defending nation. Uh, a, a roughly a 50 to 1 cost advantage over the offensive power. So if there's a power that wants to project force by sea, then it has to spend 50 times as much as the defending power to overcome those defences. That's, you know, that, that's roughly the result of a, of a study that the RAND Corporation um, conducted in, uh, in 2016. Uh, defence is cheaper than offence, right, when it comes to maritime power in particular. And surf, big surface ships, which you use to project power, are incredibly vulnerable to relatively cheap missiles. Mm. So that's the good news. Um, but I think the other the other piece of the puzzle here is that Australia in particular does need to find partners that share our strategic space. And the obvious one is Indonesia. And that's why the book calls for uh, a kind of alliance with, the, with uh, Indonesia, uh, a much closer military partnership than we've ever had before. I'm actually in the process of writing a longer essay on this topic now for... Australian foreign affairs, which will come out in the middle of the year. So, so it, it really argues that Australia and Indonesia share the same strategic space, and therefore we have you know roughly equal interest in making sure that China never becomes the dominant maritime power in our part of the world. And also, we can help the Indonesians. We're much smaller than them, but we're much more sophisticated militarily. Uh, so we can help Indonesia to develop the kind of maritime denial capabilities that they currently lack. I think there's an ASEAN meeting in. Australia in next Melbourne week next week, or so, yeah. Or something. yeah, in Melbourne next week, and obviously there's just been the Indonesian election, the new president. Yep, Prabowo Subianto. Yep. Do those events? I mean, uh, well, what's the sort of shape of that idea, or the potential pathway to that idea? Do you think? Where's the near term opportunity? I guess to 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 take that. Yeah, look, it's a it's a distant prospect. It has to be said, and in 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 the essay, I try to um, anticipate some of the obvious counter arguments, the practical objections to Australia ever forming any kind of military alliance with Indonesia. Um, it it is still far off, and I think fun, the the most fundamental one is that is that Indonesia and Australia just view China very differently. Um, so Australia has, um, you know. T- Taken a much more um, uh, a much more strident stance against uh, Chinese strategic power than Indonesia has ever done. Indonesia is a non-aligned nation traditionally. Uh, Indonesia you know, has a very uh, strong economic relationship with China that it needs to protect. A large Chinese diaspora as well, and it would be a huge leap for China to go into a, a, any kind of alliance relationship that implies that it is taking a kind of anti-China position. So all, all of those things I accept. Uh, I, I guess what I'm assuming is that China's relationship with Indonesia is going to get worse over time because China's ambitions will collide ever more directly with Indonesia's interests. The obvious flashpoint is the Natuna Sea, which is a part of the Southeast Asia that um, is in dispute between uh, China and Indonesia, uh, but even, but but even putting that aside, there's a sense that um, uh, China would like to be the kind of power in which other uh, Southeast Asian nations essentially become subsumed under Chinese hegemony, and so I think uh, I think there's a good chance that Indonesia ultimately is going to resist that even though it does take a more ambiguous position on China than Australia does. Uh, I think ultimately it is going to resist that. In order to do it, uh, it might decide that it needs Australia's help. So I think Australia should be there uh, when Indonesia takes that turn and when it decides uh, to do that. 
I've seen speculation that Indonesia may at some point join the sort of BRICS plus group. Um, do you think there's a likely prospect or? Oh, that's interesting. I, I hadn't actually heard of it. So I, I, I'm not in a good position to comment, but um, I, I, I'll just offer one slightly broader observation, which is that Indonesia is in its in its own right, a great power in the making. I mean, we, we kind of underestimate Indonesian power in Australia, but uh, there are there are solid projections that by the middle of the century, it's going to be one of the t- top five economies in the world. Um, what, what Indonesia really needs is to be able to harness all of that economic power in terms of state power, uh, which it can't do at the moment. The Indonesian state is still relatively weak. Uh, and also Indonesia hasn't really developed a coherent foreign policy identity since the end of the Cold War. It's still clings onto the non-alignment ideal, even though that's really a Cold War idea, which doesn't have that much relevance to the world we're in now. Uh, and it hasn't been forced to seek a new identity. And um, well, I guess what I'm really counting on is that eventually China will be the for- forcing mechanism for Indonesia to develop that leadership and that identity as a great power, which ought to provide some level of balance against Chinese ambitions. It's making the Indo-Pacific a very fascinating place at the moment, isn't it? Because, I mean, India is arguably a great power now. Yeah, we've... And, you know, China is definitely so. In some ways, Japan is still maybe, I don't know. And and have got Indonesia in prospect and potentially even Australia could be a diplomatic powerhouse. So, um, but we're just about at the end of the hour. So I just wanted to say thank you so much, Sam, for an absolutely fantastic uh, discussion about Australia's place in the world. Um, did you want to say one last thing perhaps before we... Uh, only to thank you, Jeff, for a really rich conversation. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.